Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we had had a very lively discussion on the state of art, and we had a very good overview from Kun Lee and also Sumita, and with a, a wonderful uh, comments uh, from, from Tillman and Abi Jun. And I think that the much of the debate we're talking about, so what had been uh, the globalization had been a, a great uh, driving force for catching up and also learning because it kind of facilitated the, the knowledge flow, either through people, commodity, export, investment, all are there. And now we are also facing, and also we recognize that there is a geopolitical change taking place and how it might impact the future trend and what could be the opening issue that we might have to face as a community. So I, that's also, this is a, section two, which look at the future research agenda. So now we have a very good ground covered, thanks to all, you, all of you. So now I would like to invite a wonderful speaker, Xiaolang Fu, and uh, I think uh, she's here with us, I guess. And uh, I would like to invite you to speak. Please, Xiaolang. Uh, many thanks uh, to Michiko for the kind uh, introduction and to Rasmus for inviting me to this uh, important meeting. Um, I think uh, this is the 20th anniversary of Globalix, but also I think it's a very important moment to take stock and also looking forward on the, I think we're living in a world really at the crossroad. Uh, in addition to the geopolitical uh, disruptions and there are also technological disruption, uh, uh, environmental and also other social or uh, disruptions. Uh, so it's an important uh, moment to take stock and uh, looking forward. Uh, I will share my screen, only have uh, four slides, but uh, I will be quick uh, looking at the future research agendas. And the many thanks to Quen Li uh, uh, and the Smita um, and also the, the very nice uh, uh, comments from Tillman uh, Abido and the, and the great to see Luke uh, today and uh, thanks for your important comments. Uh, so Kuni has discussed the interface between global and the local and also uh, uh, Smita has called for the need of for newer and the wider uh, approaches to the question of local development. So looking at um, the uh, agenda for the future research, so I today I want to mainly uh, focus on, on four issues. First is about integrating the global and the local approaches, the role of open national innovation system in catch up. Uh, and also the second is look at the wider aspect of development and structural change, looking at the digital and the green transformations and the new windows of, of opportunity and the, how the developing countries can build up the uh, technological capability to seize the opportunities. Uh, thirdly, uh, we're um, looking at the broad developing countries, uh, the type of uh, under the radar innovation in the uh, developing countries, especially the low income countries and the strategies to move uh, to above the radar innovation so that they can benefit more from the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, fourthly, all this will relate, all those questions will relate to the challenges of degradation or disruption. In a way, I kind of uh, agree with Tillman. Um, we should um, kind of, you know, um, uh, hold a pause for a moment to, to buy in the concept of degradation. And so I'm using disruption. So the, the challenges of disruption on structure change and the technological upgrading in the developing countries. Uh, if I have time, I want to make also bring in some uh, reflections on the new research methods uh, uh, for uh, technology and innovation. I, I know Carlo will, will um, talk uh, uh, his ideas about this. I, I will so um, I will be very brief on this. Um, first is about. Um, uh, 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 Quinn has uh, discussed about the catch-up uh, uh, project, uh, the, uh, the integration of global value chain with the local uh, innovation system and the relationship between global and the local. 
uh, and also uh, the need to integrate in the both the global and the local approaches. And actually, um, there is a role of an open national innovation system uh, for the developing countries in their catch up. Um, and this open national innovation system is built upon the uh, national innovation system framework. Um, uh, well, you know, we are looking at this NIS national innovation system in the age of the globalization. And in the past, since the 1980s, in the past kind of three decades, we see that the uh, country's national innovation system has been opened up and, uh, you know, integrated into the global innovation system uh, to a different degree in different countries by the intensified uh, uh, flow a uh, cross-border flow of goods, uh, of foreign direct investment, and also the, the cross-border flow of people, uh, as Michika has uh, 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 summarized, and also through internet, which facilitates much faster and accessible, cheaper, uh, affordable knowledge exchange uh, uh, across uh, countries. And also international innovation collaboration has been also been intensified and become innovation has increasingly become a collaborative uh, undertaking. And based on, on all these, um, the countries uh, um, in, in the national innovation system increasingly become an open national innovation system. This allows the countries to uh, build up their innovation capacity and upgrade their technological capability, you know, based on the resources and the talents and the, and the, and the both financial and the human resources in both the domestic and the global international markets um, uh, and the global innovation system and they can benefit it um, from you know participating and the sales to the both the domestic and the international markets and that's why we call this is an open national innovation system in this open national innovation system the both the indigenous innovation in by the local uh, players the universities the, the local uh, uh, companies and also international knowledge technology transfer and exchange uh, all play a very important role um, only by doing combine these two that can countries especially the developing countries can learn and build up their innovation capability at a faster speed and can catch up, uh, can catch up. So that's the, the open national innovation system. Uh, um, so further research in this, come back to the, to, to the question that uh, uh, Quinny and uh, Luke has, this, um, uh, has raised is how this um, di disruption and the deglobalization will impact this open national innovation system and, uh, and affect the opportunities for the developing countries to catch up. Um, the second areas for future research uh, then relate to uh, what Smita has uh, called for a newer and a broader approach uh, to the local to local development. So looking at a wider aspect of development and structural change, uh, here in particular, uh, relate to the innovation and the technology, in particular, the uh, uh, digital and the green transformation and the new windows of opportunity that these two transformations can bring to the developing countries and uh, how the countries can um, create and seize and benefit from these new windows of opportunity. Uh, Rasmus and the Roberta and I have uh, um, uh, jointly um, edited a special issue on the green windows of opportunity based on uh, case studies uh, in the renewable energy in China and also some cross-country study. And we found that this green transformation can offer a new window of opportunity for the developing countries to catch up. However, this uh, new windows opportunity is, was mostly uh, created by the changes uh, uh, in institutional changes. So there is a need uh, for a proactive role uh, of the state uh, through uh, regulatory institutional change to create this uh, uh, windows opportunity. And also uh, um, there is a role of 
both the local innovation system and also international uh, uh, knowledge transfer um, uh, and exchange uh, in seizing and benefiting from uh, uh, these uh, new windows of opportunity. This digital transformation also offered uh, um, uh, new windows of opportunity for the developing countries. Uh, looking at Africa, um, so mobile diffusion is probably one of the only area that Africa has kept parallel growth uh, to the rest of the world. And, uh, and this new uh, digital technology as a fundamental infrastructure, general technology can create a platform and allow a lot of uh, um, innovative applications, which I call under the radar innovation uh, in Africa that firms in Africa in the developing countries are good at in, in, in carrying out so that uh, bring opportunities to leapfrog, to leapfrog due to the uh, uh, low sunk cost in the developing countries. But the question is how, you know, through technological uh, uh, technology and innovation studies, how can we help the developing countries through policy changes, through local capabilities development, help them to create and seize the, 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 uh, uh, these uh, windows of, of opportunity. So that's the second uh, areas of uh, for future research, especially how uh, the small and the medium enterprises, how the informal economy, the firms in the informal sector can build up the capacity and the benefit from this uh, uh, new opportunity. The third question then relates again to the earlier question closely is um, the, my earlier study in Africa finds that actually firms in Africa, they are active, they are active. However, um, their innovation are not laboratory based, most of their uh, innovation not laboratory based, so we cannot measure them using the traditional indicators, such as R&D investment, number of publications or number of patents. Uh, there are a lot of incremental learning based uh, uh, innovation in which are new to the firm or new to the country, new to the country. So this uh, uh, under the radar innovation helped the African firms to survive and to grow. Mm -hmm. However, in the new wave of industrial revolution, which is very much technology and capital intensive, those technology uh, under the radar innovation will not be sufficient themselves to support the African countries to leapfrog uh, the innovation gap. And we need strategies to move the innovations in, in Africa to above the radar. So enhance the scientific uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, content in the innovation in Africa and help them to be able to uh, benefit more and also participate, create those new fourth, in, uh, fourth of industrial revolution uh, innovations in the African continent. Um, fourthly, come to the uh, question about uh, challenges of deglobalization. You know, all you know, we 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 look at it broadly. It's the disruptions uh, uh, on the structure change and the innovation in the developing countries. Since globalix focus a lot on the de developing world, so um, also globalix as a global community actually. Um, not only not easily buying a concept, buying the concept of uh, uh, deglobalization, probably we also can think about as global, as a leading global think uh, 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 academic community to lead global thinking, whether, you know, wh where the world should go. As Luke has mentioned, this has significant impact on globalists and also on the, on, on the whole world, because this knowledge security will affect uh, cross-country knowledge exchange, affect international collaboration, affect open science, et cetera. So um, if we look you know, uh, this broadly, recently I'm uh, co-editing a special issue uh, for uh, R&D management. The core is open, uh, I think just in a few days uh, on, uh, in December this year. 
So we are, we are looking at uh, the R&D management uh, on the disruption and uncertainty. And actually, you know, in, in this special issue, we mainly take the innovation systems approach, both national and the sectoral innovation systems. Uh, and uh, we are looking at both technological disruption like uh, the, the fourth digital oh, oh, revolution, institutional oh, disruption, uh, including um, you know the job uh, the, the disruptions caused by by geopolitical tension, uh, but also other uh, uh, institutional change, environmental disruption, including the natural uh, uh, disasters and also climate change and the market disruptions, including the disruptions caused by the COVID nineteen and also the lockdown uh, and the disruptions to the to the uh, global uh, supply chain value chain. So how this impact on the innovation system at the national and the uh, 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 sector level, and also innovation activities at the firm level, and how these disruptions can interact and reinforce each other. Like this time during the, 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 the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we see this geopolitical tension together with the, the, the technological uh, 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 digital transformation together with the COVID-19 disruption. Of course, recently here we have the war and also the, the, the disruption caused by, um, by the uh, terrorism, as Smith has mentioned, and also the war, as Luke mentioned. So all these, you know, how they kind of uh, interact with each other and the impact on the innovation um, interac interaction between national innovation systems, as Luke mentioned, uh, and also at national level oh, um, um, uh, on the national innovation system, for example, what role do disruption play in, in, in innovation systems? When and how they affect you know, uh, um, different actors in the national innovation system and how do their interactions impact on the uh, each players and the linkages play uh, between the players and also the linkages between the different national innovation systems and how can different countries build continue to build their national innovation systems in an era of disruption uh quinn has mentioned the resource-based view which is kind of withdraw because of the deglobalization and actually if we go back to the resource based approach, the developing countries, because innovation is costly, risky, past dependent, then the developing countries will really lag behind further. We still need an open national innovation system, um, which is both benefits for the developing countries, but also both benefits for the developed countries too. So how we can still you know, build up a, an open national innovation system in an era of disruption? Um, and uh, will deglobalization affect international research collaboration and in what ways and how policies can you know help to enhance this uh, international research collaboration uh, in in the circumstances of uh, increasing uh, deglobalization um, uh, in addition to this um, and also we should look at what policies are effective to enable the developing countries to seize the uh, windows of opportunity in both the green windows, the digital windows, and also not only in the manufacturing sector, also as uh, Abudu uh, um, mentioned, also in the services sector, which is very important for the developing countries, for the developing countries. And how can we build a more inclusive innovation system in this uh, you know, uh, uh, under the circumstances of all this disruption, some of which will will deepen the inequality in the society, in the society, and uh, what kind of role that digital technology and other technological innovation can 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 play in building a more inclusive inclusive society, and finally, what types of disruption can open windows of opportunity for developing countries and what can would narrow the windows of opportunity and how can the developing countries to respond to this and so that they can seize the, the opportunity. 
So these are uh, examples of question at macro level, also at the sacro, uh, uh, um, the meso level, which is the, the sector level, and also how this impact uh, and the uh, responses could be different uh, in different industries of different characteristics, and also how for, what, what are the impact uh, on the firms uh, in the developing countries, especially the SMEs, and uh, and the what kind of firm level strategies uh, uh, you know firms can can uh, can adopt um, to respond to this uh, the, uh, the impact of such disruptions and uncertainty and again is global as a global community you know how we can play a role to lead the way of thinking uh, uh, lead the way of thinking um, maybe more proactively uh, uh, than than just to respond just to respond but maybe more proactively on setting the agenda, uh, setting uh, uh, you know uh, uh, shed light to the way of future development of the whole global community. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaolan. Um, your points were very pertinent to this uh, second session because you are actually uh, looking at the open national innovation and how it, uh, the importance of which, and especially under this uh, de-globalizing world and highlighting uh, various aspects of um, uh, well, the two, two windows, um, digitalization and green uh, technologies. And then these are the kind of wind, could be a windows of opportunity. And I really also like the point that the, you always try to look at the, the impact on the global south, which is what our communities are uh, about. And uh, also uh, highlighting about the importance of this kind of community in um, facilitating and exchanging the ideas and also uh, push for the uh, spearheading the, the discussion and uh, beyond what uh, just uh, uh, being reactive, but be proactive. Thank you very much. And I would like to now give a floor to uh, Yao Shao. Uh, yeah, uh, are you? Here? Yeah, okay. Ciao. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'll give a floor to you uh, as, a, as a discussant, please. Thank you, thank Michiko. Uh, and first of all, um, thank you, Rasmus, for inviting me to this important event. Um, I definitely resonate that. Um, the speakers before have already covered an excellent ground of the challenges we have, in particular uh, in relation to development studies. Uh, Kyung Lee, Smita, uh, Tillman, um, and uh, Abidon, and also a presentation uh, by Xiaolan, uh, which is an excellent coverage of what could be the future research agenda. So my role would be also as a discussant, uh, building on Xiaolan's presentation and how we could move forward uh, the discussion. Um, I, I have prepared three slides, so if that is okay, I will uh, quickly put that up. Um, and please let me know if you could uh, see my screen well. Yes, we can see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, I am a social scientist uh, at IAVAG in Switzerland, and I'm affiliated with the Utrecht University in the Netherlands uh, as an assistant professor. So I work at the intersection of development, sustainability transitions, and earth system governance. So today, uh, I hope I could partially live up to the uh, expectation and share my perspective from this uh, three major realms of research. So um, I, I, I would like to uh, um, build on the discussion by Xiaolan to widen our understanding of structural transformation. So, so um, I want to discuss what does structural transformation mean from a sustainability transition perspective. So sustainability transition studies is an established uh, research field that deals with system transformation uh, and also how we could reconfigure our infrastructure systems. So structural transformation for individual nations from the perspective of transition studies basically means that developing countries could simultaneously aim for economic development and uplift, uh, uplifting the living standards of these countries. In other words, um, I, I would just quickly use, in other words, 
infrastructure and provision systems in developing countries can be proactively shaped. Um, and instead of aiming just market and industrial leadership, developing countries could aim for system transformation. And usually we talk about social technical reconfiguration of provision systems. Provision systems means energy provision, water provision, clean sanitation or transportation system. Therefore, instead of waiting for trickle down effects, such as um, first gaining market and economic leadership, and then having more financial resources and stronger public policy to then build up infrastructure systems to provide high quality living standards, um, um, let's not wait for this trickle down effect, but immediately aim for both. So in some of my previous works, uh, we have talked about, and also in, in resonance uh, with uh, Xiaolan's point, how developing countries can endogenize or more proactively shape windows of opportunity. Um, um, so that instead of waiting for external windows, how can developing countries proactively engage in, in shaping the sectoral selection environment, shaping new technical standards, regulations, and policies to identify new uh, technological uh, uh, trajectories. And recently, we also um, published a paper on, on how developing countries can start moving towards transformative leapfrogging. So essentially, the main point here is about uh, when we are facing grand sustainability challenges, how can developing countries um, break out of globally predefined trajectories. So, so this is often referred to um, the kind of structures and diffusion patterns imposed by, let's say, global value chains. So it is important that when developing countries are achieving leapfrogging, they are also breaking out of the globally predefined trajectories set forth by the global north, because most of the time, these trajectories of footsteps are rather polluting. So we argue that when we have transformative leapfrogging, developing countries can have more radical jumps, not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of institutions, which includes informal rules of the game, uh, legitimation, etc. So when they are able to achieve this kind of uh, leapfrogging that can break out of predefined trajectories, um, they could shape new social technical configurations in their energy systems, water provision systems, transport systems. And if this can be exported or not exported, just picked up and adapted by other developing countries, they have a higher potentials for leapfrogging. So the challenge here is identify new processes, indicators, and conditions so developing countries can actually shape their own development trajectories and break out of predefined trajectories. Uh, so this, this slide mainly talks about uh, the, the relative autonomy of individual nations, developing countries. And the second point that I would like to make is rather the challenge for researchers like ourselves when we are concerned with development. What are the challenges ahead to conceptualize new development uh, uh, theories or frameworks that are in line with Earth system boundaries? And this was already discussed by some of our previous um, um, speakers. Uh, and I just want to highlight that Earth system boundaries here essentially means identify development uh, pathways that can be ecologically sustainable, respecting the environmental ecological ceilings, but also globally just at the same time. So I have um, just three points on this, but just for the first point, I want to bring this up um, um, on the, the recent paper on uh, which we proposed four major latecomer development pathways. Um, and this is to uh, also building on the discussion earlier, how can we broaden the literature realm of uh, the global leaks and also catching up studies uh, and also marry with other broader uh, literatures. So here we build this typology based on two major dimensions. I will just quickly go through this. Um, first, uh, we basically um, extend the original framework of uh, Kyung Lee um, and, and, and 
sort of break it down in terms of radicality of change into path following and path creating. And then we combine it with sustainability transition studies um, to see how we can really broaden the concept of development in view of grand sustainability challenges. So on the left um, is where the aim for developing countries remain at a knowledge focused, uh, technology focused, and, and aiming for global value chains reconfiguration. But in times of grand sustainability challenges, we need to aim for also social technical system reconfiguration. That means not just aiming to change the technologies, but also to change institutions, informal rules of the games, belief systems, legitimations, et cetera. So with that, we, we came up with four major development pathways. Uh, there is the technology catching up, um, and, and then there is the uh, 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 leapfrogging, uh, typical leapfrogging that we know, forging ahead, but then still within uh, predefined uh, global value chains. And when we think about grand sustainability challenges, we could have another pathway that is greening of domestic sectors. This happens to many developing countries that um, they, they want to uh, uh, green their domestic sectors, but they use a path following strategy. So they import the latest global technologies, but it is not sufficient enough to transform their local uh, environments because these globally existing technologies don't work well with their local conditions. And lastly, we point to um, the pathway of transformative leapfrogging, uh, whereby developing countries really make use and better understand their local environment. With that, um, they could potentially develop new social technical regimes uh, that work for their local conditions. And if that could be picked up and adapted and replicated in other developing countries, this could potentially lead to transformative leapfrogging. Now, this is an open question. And in view of development that is within the Earth system boundaries, we need to broaden the transformative potentials of developing countries. We, in other words, us, the, the researchers, the scholars, we have to identify new conditions, mechanisms whereby developing countries can also leapfrog in terms of sustainable sourcing, reuse of materials and waste. The second is that Thinking from about globally just development, looking at this typology, we see that the success of a latecomer country may trap another in a less sustainable pathway. For instance, we learned that um, the, the transformative leapfrogging, potential transformative leapfrogging of China, let's say in their energy provision infrastructure system, uh, could have left country like Malaysia, which is my home country, uh, rather stay in the technology catching up pathway in the solar photovoltaic wind industry. So China, uh, Malaysia did well in technology catching up, but they are having troubles to really green their domestic sectors because it doesn't work well with their local conditions. Um, another more extreme example will be uh, the, the leapfrogging of uh, solar photovoltaic uh, or energy infrastructures of China. When that is diffused to African countries, uh, we see more justice issues appearing. So we, we can see that the, uh, less developed countries will be trapped in other pathways when someone else uh, did better in this regard. So, so how can we start understanding these different trade-offs? And as researchers, we have to be more attentive and sensitive um, to these uh, uh, um, consequences as a result of one pathway uh, as opposed to another. Perhaps you can wrap up quite uh, quickly. Yeah, okay. So um, this is my last slide. Um, to, to understand development in line with Earth system boundaries and building on uh, Shalan's uh, point um, is also about uh, um, digitalization, more opportunities, and green transformation. We are now at the age of green techno-economic paradigm with accelerated transitions, or some will call it deep transition. So 
in in this perspective, we are expecting sectoral shifts in multiple sectors in parallel. Um, when we think of digitalization, etc., and transition scholars call this as multi-system transitions. This is when uh, nations and companies powerful companies can start shaping new and more sustainable meta rules known as shared rules uh, formal institutions in terms of technical standards regulations but also informal rules of the games that span across many four sectors so, so think of batteries that can be integrated across many four sectors so here we want to ask how can developing countries have a say in this find new strategies and positionings to co-shape this future of green techno economic paradigm or this emerging deep transition era. Now, the last point is to reflect on also uh, Xiaolan's uh, and other speakers' point about deglobalization, uh, which I would also uh, highlight that we have to see this as an increasing global fragmentation of value systems. That means we have increasingly fragmented values, belief systems across nations on a global level. And um, when, when we have these differentiated value systems, it could impact the manifold systems that is about to uh, uh, develop um, in, in, in the same time, at the same time. And here we could start thinking about examples from disruptive meta infrastructure, because um, we are not just facing a global fragmentation as a result of war. Smita also mentioned about aerospace satellite systems. What we are anticipating beyond just this war is that we are seeing meta infrastructures such as space-based navigation systems, monitoring systems, but also emerging controversial ideas on geoengineering. So this meta infrastructure will shift the meta rules with many four uh, with implications on many four sectors um, in the in the in the near future. The implications to this these meta infrastructure or fragmentation of value systems is highly unclear and it could lead to more or less globally just development. So as scholars, we have to pay attention to um, these challenges. So with that, um, I will end my uh, discussion and um, stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, you did a very a good uh, sort of additional uh, perspective from the uh, system transformation perspective and also presenting the very interesting conceptual framework that I think uh, many of us can be able to build upon uh, in further research. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think uh, because of the, we have not been asked uh, getting um, the, uh, everybody else's kind of uh, view. So I would like to open the discussion to the floor. And if anyone would like to speak or whether to ask question, not only to Xiaolan and also uh, 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 Xiao, uh, Xiao, <laughs> Shaoshan, but uh, including the uh, earlier speaker, uh, Kunli and Sumita and uh, Tilman and Abidon, and oh, I mean, all these people, uh, if anyone would like to comment or to um, ask questions uh, up until now, all the discussions, uh, you can raise your hands or um, and open the question, uh, open the, the microphone. Is there anyone? Yeah, I, I can ask a few questions. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, Eduardo, please. Yeah. yeah thank yeah, you, you Michiko, that. and thank you all for, for this very interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, I have many questions here, but uh, I, I like a sh a Shaoshan that you introduced this justice aspect uh, because I think this in this context of global value chains is also important to to consider to what extent we will keep turning a blind eye that the convenience that we have here in Europe uh, and affordable and accessible products they are in some industries of. Uh, related to semi-slave labor and child labor or 
that my electric car that I can easily charge in the, the corner of my house in the Netherlands, probably to produce that battery, some families were displaced uh, in the global south. And I think we as uh, researchers in innovation, technology and development, I think this should be really very explicit topics in our research agendas. Yes, thank you, uh, Eduardo. Um, yeah, I think um, that is uh, really a challenge for um, development studies, and especially when we um, tend to focus or put over emphasis on national competitiveness. And of course, national competitiveness remains uh, very important for developing countries that requires uh, more economic growth and therefore uh, also uh, better living standards with better infrastructure systems. Um, but then, you know, it is a challenge for researchers like ourselves to start thinking, um, how can we uh, improve on the notion of national competitiveness? And what do we mean by leapfrogging? You know, uh, these radical jumps that we want for developing countries in view of grand challenges. Um, um, can it be done in a more, more just way? And, and we really have to take on this global perspective that is beyond single national competitiveness competitiveness so that when we understand the success of uh, one country we can understand the implications to other the rest of the less um, developing uh, developed countries in this regard thank you okay thank you very much um i think the justice is a very important subject that uh, we all seem to overlook um uh Kunli, I, I think you yeah. have you, you have yeah. your hand yeah i have a short um uh, uh, comment about uh, very short mentioning by um, uh, Shaolan about uh, uh, the resource based development strategy. I think I think it's not necessarily a retreat of those things because um, it is really, I mean, the really innovation and the knowledge based uh, uh, industries is different from old resource based one, which is not really based on knowledge innovation. Maybe Michiko has more say on the wine uh, uh, same industry. They are only they all learn from foreign resources and cultivate local capability and their target or export market. So it's somewhat different from old style resource based development strategy. And uh, I didn't have much time to elaborate on the details. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really uh, agree with what uh, Kun Lee said about uh, the, the local and global learning were there. I, I think that the, the you know, kind of uh, past, we had a very naive view about globalization, that the globalization was there uh, to be uh, given. And then uh, we, we kind of used this as an opportunity to learn. I mean, that the developing country had, had the opportunity to learn this, uh, use that globalization, global flow, to learn and then capture, and then the state was a baby uh, capable uh, in trying to turn this learning uh, forward. But the uh, uh, current situation seems to show some different aspect. Uh, it could be the, the deglobalization and also the digitalization, green. These are all giving a very new perspective in how to deal with the uh, learning, uh, I guess. Uh, and I see the hands of uh, Erica. So Erica, please. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks so much for the for the presentations. This has been um, uh, fascinating and great to hear everybody that has spoken. Um, there are many. I think there are, there are many questions also in the chat uh, that 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 maybe at some point uh, uh, we'll have to to revisit and so on. But I um, yes, and I have myself many many thoughts that have been triggered by by this by these presentations. But I. Maybe one point that I that uh, that I would like to bring up is this: what I've been hearing, um, uh, it's it's is is quite a lot of emphasis on this connection between uh, structural transformation and um, the institutional structure uh, uh, and institutional innovation. In a way, I think the word hasn't been used, but uh, but but it's, it's it's become clear that structural transformation has has taken place. Um, uh, in in, um, in in countries with a certain around a certain institutional structure, so institutions are very important, and you know the the role of the state, but also other institutions 
um, has been emphasized by many, you know, in, 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 in driving structural transformation. But I think um, bringing in what uh, Xiaolan and also um, Xiaoshan have, have highlighted, you know, this issue of proactiveness, uh, we know less about how developing countries can be proactive in, a, in the space of institutional innovation and public sector innovation in this whole story of driving structural transformation. And I think, I think that's a very important point that has resonated a lot with, um, with me. I've taken that message uh, because I think you know, a proactivity in the space of public sector innovation uh, has not been sufficiently um, uh, explored. And then uh, uh, something that I wanted to, to bring up as well is this, uh, you know, we've been, we've been discussing or, or, or uh, look and, and others have raised the, this poly crisis um, uh, context uh, to us. And then others have talked about these poly opportunities, right? So we are looking at this, at this um, you know, there's been studies looking at, for instance, exploring the, um, the opportunities around digital transformation. Others have looked at the opportunities around um, green industrialization. Um, uh, um, and others have looked at opportunities around regional uh, value chains, um, uh, you know, in the context of, uh, you know, these dynamics of globalization and deglobalization and so on. But exploring the poly opportunities at that nexus, you know, how to bring all of that together. Um, how can one ensure that developing countries can benefit for these new opportunities in, in, in regional uh, value chains, as well as considering this, bringing in this digital transformation and, and, and the greening of, of, of production and so on. I think that is less explored. And I think it pushes us methodologically a lot, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we explore this nexus? Um, uh, this poly opportunity, poly uh, crisis, <laughs> very complex environment. So I think it's a no, very uh, it's it's not a question to anybody. It's just maybe a way of structuring what I've taken from what I heard. Much more, yeah. but yes, thanks so much. Thank you. Perhaps the Shaolan, because you were talking at the end of your presentation, talking about new methodologies. Is it something that is associated with what the, um, what the um, Erika Erika just mentioned. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think um, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I very much like the comments made by earlier uh, uh, our discussants, and also uh, Erika uh, mentioned very importantly this poly crisis, poly opportunities, and also how the interactions you know uh, of different uh, uh, challenges, different uh, 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 disruptions, they may interact, you know, uh, uh, and uh, how developing countries can uh, respond or benefit uh, uh, from these opportunities or respond to this complex, really complex situation, complex uh, challenges. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, Erica mentioned this uh, uh, institutional and, uh, and the public uh, innovations. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree. This is an area uh, under-researched. Um, and uh, so looking at the, 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 the methods, what I am, I, um, first is really related to the measurement. How to measure public innovation, how to measure institutional innovation, including, you know, a lot of innovations in, uh, in the uh, developing countries, the low income countries, um, they cannot be measured by the traditional indicators, how to fully capture those type of innovation, rather than you know, just assume the developed countries are not innovative. So uh, I think the first is, uh, area is about, uh, the, we need new measurements. We need to de develop indicators and the new, new, new measurements. Secondly is to use new um, methods. Um, uh, like when we look at uh, all these in, uh, um, public in innovations, institutional innovations, uh, many may be related to you know uh, some kind of policies or regulatory changes, etc. cetera. Um, well, one thing is about this RCT, randomized uh, uh, controlled experiment, which in uh, like the World Bank use a lot in uh, development uh, economics. Uh, I, I know for innovation, innovation studies, sometimes, at the firm level, it will be very costly and 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 and, and difficult to implement design and implement a randomized controlled experiment. But nowadays, when we look at a lot of innovations at a 
you know, affect the grassroots or the grassroots kind of uh, uh, participation in the uh, uh, led innovation. So a lot of um, uh, institutional uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the public innovations, um, a lot relates to the green transformations may, you know, uh, relate to the uh, uh, individuals. Uh, I think introducing the RCT, the good thing is that the, uh, the, the, the traditional regression approach, um, you know, sometimes cannot really be revealed to us whether the change really caused by the, by the, by the, by the policy or, or, you know, because it is a trend. And uh, secondly, uh, again, also relates to all this, I think um, the new uh, methods like machine learning, deep learning, especially deep learning, good at analyzing the texts. Uh, and the, you know, all these can help us to, 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 uh, to uh, codify a lot of data previously are in the, uh, buried in the uh, text and, uh, and uh, including those under the radar innovation, including the public uh, innovation and institutional innovation. Sometimes they are not just you know, uh, codified as one innovation or we can uh, use uh, deep learning to 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 uh, uh, collect the data from the uh, from the the the, the, the huge uh, um, bodies of uh, government documents reports uh, uh, and the newspapers etc and also carry out study so these are the, the new methods i think could be very useful for innovation especially those type of innovation traditionally difficult to measure Invisible under the radar. Yeah. So that's that's my thought. Yeah. Thank you, Michina. Good, good, good question. Thank yeah. You so much, Simon. I think you had made an excellent introduction to the next uh, section because this is next section is policy method and indicators. So I would give a floor to I mean uh, Marina. I think Marina is uh, uh, the third uh, facilitator. But thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Xiaolan, and also uh, Xiaoyan. Um, for wonderful presentations. Thank you.